So I'm, I'm very happy to introduce our panelists for this evening. And these are all of our friends and I'm so delighted to be here with them. And I want to start with uh, my friend, Reverend Nancy Fostro, who is the Director of Latinx Studies at the Seminary of the Southwest. And I have been listening to her preach and being inspired for a good number of times now and just think the absolute world of her and her passionate, radical way of living her faith out in, in this world. It's so such a delight to walk alongside her, to learn from her and to, to work with her. And then uh, Reverend Juan uh, uh, Sandoval, who is the Archdeacon in the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta. Juan is this very quiet presence in this diocese that has been so generous toward me and never says no to me when I ask him to help with doing programs and things. And I'm so delighted to have people be that willing to help support the, the efforts that the Absalom Jones Center is trying to do. I'm so thankful for his untiring commitment and willingness to step up to, to the plate to all kinds of ideas that come out of my head. So thank you, Juan, for for saying yes to this one more idea that's come out of my head. And Reverend Fabio Sotillo, who I went to Honduras with him and got, I have rheumatoid arthritis and I had an attack and wasn't able to walk. And Reverend Fabio and one other friend ended up having to carry me around. Talk about somebody going beyond the call of duty to help you. I mean, it's just amazing. And I didn't, I, we worked together in Honduras and we worked together so well. And it was the first time we'd actually been somewhere working together. I don't speak Spanish. And he was the, the person helping to tell people what I was talking about and tell me what people were talking about to me. And, you know, we just became partners on pilgrims. All of us, all three of us, our four of us, are pilgrims and partners, and so glad to be on this pilgrimage together and in this partnership. And tonight, what we want to do is to talk some about what it's like for them as they journey in this country and in this culture and in this world, in the bodies that God has given to them as people, as Latinx people. And we um, advertised this uh, event tonight, and we said, we wanted to get beyond immigration. We have a habit of wanting to talk about black and brown people always in terms of problems, problems. We always wanna, you know, Du Bois says, it's, it's really uh, maddening to always be considered a problem. And, and all of us are so much more than that. And so tonight I would invite you all to talk some about whatever you wanna talk about, but to start with just saying what part of the world you're from and, and any kind of general comments you'd like to make about your, your journey here, your, the work you're doing, about your, the faith journey, whatever you'd like to say is a beginning. Let's start there and then we'll see where we go with the conversation. And just for the sake of the audience, I wanna say that we will talk together for about the next 45 minutes, uh, 30, 40 minutes, and then we will spend some time entertaining your comments and questions. And if you will just put them in the chat box and Juan and Nancy and Fabio will help me keep up with what's in the chat box. And so we will, we will do this together as a team. So why don't we start with you, Juan? Well, good evening to everyone. God's blessings to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I am Juan Sandoval, and as Catherine said, I am a, the arch, one of the archdeacons for the Diocese of Atlanta. Uh, my day-to-day -day work is in the Cathedral of St. Philip. I, I am in charge of the Hispanic ministries and set up the different uh, programs and services that we do there and special services. And I hope we will get to talk a little bit about those things. As far as my background goes, I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, many years ago, many, many years ago. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so I, I grew up not speaking English. I spoke only Spanish. I lived next, no, next door to my abuela. And if you don't know what abuela means, that means my grandmother. Okay. And so I've spent most of my life in church in some manner. My grandmother would come in the morning to take me to La Misa, the mass, the service, the Eucharist in the morning at 7 a.m. And in the evening, she would take me to go pray El Rosario, the rosary in the evening at St. Anthony, San Antonio's church in Phoenix there. So that, that was my start and it continued and I'm obviously still in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been able to not only, you know, be part of the culture, but live other parts of the cultures and having opportunities to, to spend an extended period of time in El Salvador and some time in Cuba and also uh, I did some time in Spain. So that, those are all good things. And in Spain, I got to study Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross, which are wonderful mystics, wonderful writers and uh, great poets, all of them. Uh, right now, I, am, uh, I spend my time trying to, besides working with the Hispanic people, I work with pastoral care and uh, most recently working with the Episcopal Preaching Foundation, of which the other two panelists are also part of that. God bless you both. Uh, for the first ever, check this out, the first ever Deacon's Preaching Conference, all in Spanish. So we have people from Canada, mm -hmm. from Colombia, from Ecuador, from the Dominican Republic, from Puerto Rico, and all across the United States. And so it's the first, so we're, we're doing some work on that and we hope to have more of that in the future. So I, I think I've said about it. Oh, and I'm on the board of Absalom Jones uh, Center for Racial Healing. And I am so proud. I always put that on my resume so people can see <laughs> that I'm doing that. God bless you, Catherine, for all you do. Thank I think you. that's enough so, for me. Thank you. And how about you, Nancy? Well, hi, everyone. Uh, Nancy Presto. I, as you heard, I serve as the Director of Latinx Studies at the Seminary of Southwest. Uh, but really, I am a parish priest at heart. Uh, parish ministry is what I feel, have felt, and have, will always feel called to do. And right now, the Lord has put me in a seminary, and I'm, I'm trusting the Lord on this. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the Lord knows best, obviously. Um, and one of the, one of the beautiful things that I've discovered in my most current role is the love that I have for parish ministry, the love that I have for the Latinx community, um, is something that helps me guide the future generation of priests that are coming up, um, to think beyond the immigration issues that come with the Latino community, but to start seeing the gifts, uh, that we bring into the Episcopal church. So I am very excited about um, where God has currently led me. Um, I, I will also add that while, it, while we don't want to focus on the immigration part, the immigration part is a big part of my story. Um, being that I am a DACA recipient, I was born in uh, Fresnillo, Zacatecas, Mexico and immigrated to the U.S. when I was seven years old. So I have grown up in the U.S. My first language I always play around is Spanglish. Um, and I have found a beautiful home here in the United States, but a, a, a specifically a spiritual home in the Episcopal Church. So one of the things that now that I am moving into the academic world, one of the things I'm looking at is how do, how do we discuss the issues of Latinx, indigenous spirituality? How do we bring them in conversation of who we are as Episcopalians, what does it mean to, to be part of a faith tradition that in, in many ways has injured our ancestors, has um, injured our, our homes, our, 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 our countries, but how do, how, do we, how do we navigate all of that and come together to be united um, at God's table for God's work? So this, that's the most current thing that I am 
flirting with, uh, what does that mean for me as an Episcopal priest in the Episcopal church, being a Latina in this country? Um, where, does, where does it all meet? So I invite your prayers as I navigate this very new role that I'm, uh, I am going into, uh, but I'm excited. I'm excited for the work that I'm doing right now. And for all the wonderful trouble I get to get into with Dr. Meeks and everyone she introduces me with, and my brothers, Fabio and Juan. So thank you all for joining us. I'm excited for this conversation. Yes, and, and Fabio, last but not least. Thank you, Catherine. Um, good evening, everybody. Fabio Sotelo. I was born in Colombia and I have been in, in this country, in the United States, for over 25 years. Uh, always working with Latino ministries. So 25 years getting to know people, help, helping them to navigate here in the United States, which never is easy, never is, is hard. It's hard for, I cannot imagine for those who do not have documents, even for those who do have documents, it's hard. And I'm trying to do my best to help people, different people to navigate through the, the system. So me, my work goes beyond faith. It's more about uh, trying to be a, a good human being and helping others to navigate through those these uh, systems here in, the, in, in this great nation. Um, so in my ministry today, I, I serve a community. Uh, it's a San Edwards Episcopal Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia. I came here, I was sent by the bishop actually to start a, a mission uh, within the parish in 2014, 2014 to start the, a service in Spanish. And uh, at that moment, uh, this parish have a, had a rector and, and so forth. And, uh, and I didn't know that I was going to be in the prison charge. So today I am the prison charge of this community um, serving the entire community, the entire place. And part of my work is to uh, uh, bring the communities together um, to understand that we have a lot of things in common, starting with our own baptism. And, uh, and instead of saying, you are Latino, you are Anglo, you are uh, Caribbean, you are African, it's like you are whatever your name is, according to your baptism. Let us, let, us, uh, let us build this together. And that has been my common language to all. And I believe that makes the, com the community uh, closer to each other and empowered to a common mission. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that is to start. And thank you. I am also <laughs> part of the, that is, I am part of the uh, yeah, Absalom Jones uh, Center. I am part of the board, I'm very proud. And uh, it's part of my, my DNA, DNA to work on healing and reconciliation among all of us. And, um, and the Latinos have to be part of these conversations of, about healing and reconciliation. And I, and I think I would, I, I'd love with the question you were raising, Nancy, just about the whole spirituality business and, and what the contributions are, you know, that, that you, you, you bring a cultural perspective that's not the same as mine from Arkansas. I was born and raised in the, the, the Southern part of the United States and I'm an African-American and I'm a little, the way I see things wouldn't be the same way you see it coming from uh, your part of the world. So how do we build some bridges, you all? How, how do you think, what, 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 what do we need to be trying to do just, if, just in, the, in the Episcopal Church to build some bridges that allows us to go back and forth and appreciate those gifts that, that, are, that are brought to the table. And because it's not, you know, language is not the, an issue. I mean, be, lot, lots of folks speak English and lots of people in the United States speak Spanish. So that's not an issue, but we get caught up in how people look and how they sound and where they live and where they're from. And we spend so much time on all of that until we miss out on some essentials. So how do we build, how do you all see, see that? How, how do you experience that divide that exists? I mean, like in most of our, in so many of our Episcopal churches, 
the Latinx, Hispanic, Latinx, we use both words to try to cover everybody. Services are always at some odd time. And I keep saying, don't talk to me until we have the white people meet at five o'clock and the Latinx people at 11, then talk to me. Because there's some imbalance that concerns me as, as an American. And I just wonder as you all navigate your way through this world of this faith world and the Episcopal faith world, what are some of the things that, that are troubling and how can we build bridges? Is that a fair question to ask you? Definitely, yes. Um, uh, Fabio, I, I saw you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you, you go first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry, I mean, I, 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 I jump in with a lot of passion in this question. Um, because it definitely has been my experience and the experience of those that I have served, but sometimes we get questioned if we are Episcopal enough. Mm. Um, and that's a hurtful question. Um, a lot of us um, come, well, a good number of, of, of um, the Latino community either come from Roman Catholic backgrounds or evangelical Pentecostal backgrounds. And I should add that this is very different. Like we cannot talk about the Latino community being the same. It all depends from mm -hmm. what country you come. Uh, we, are, we are multicultural in our Latines. So um, I know that for, for, for where I have served, we often get this, this question of like, that is just not Episcopal enough. Um, and mm -hmm. I always return that with, well, Tell me what is the Episcopal identity? Let's talk about mm -hmm. what the Episcopal identity is. And most people really don't even know how to answer that because we have mm -hmm. grown accustomed to, in a way, defining the Episcopal identity almost as whiteness. And that's problematic because in the Episcopal church, in the Anglican communion, we find a great diversity. Mm -hmm. um, where, I, where I would start where I have started and, and will continue to, to build bridges on is in being in conversation and listening to people's faith story. Mm -hmm. Because no matter where you come from, no matter the nationality or even the language, we all have a faith story. There is a reason there was a moment of transformation in our lives um, where I want people to tell me about Jesus. How does, how does Jesus show up in your life? How does God move in your life? And if we get people talking about the story, no matter how different our stories is, we will end up with the conclusion that is still the same God. Mm -hmm. It is still that same Jesus. It's just, they show differently in our lives. And if we can begin by honor, honoring just how God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus are showing up in our lives, we start to appreciate how God is showing up in the lives of our neighbor, in the lives of you know, our Salvadorian neighbor, our Uruguayan neighbor, our mm -hmm. Colombian neighbor, our uh, European neighbor. And if we honor those stories, like we can really start building bridges when we're not, we're not stuck on just like, what is the proper way of worship, but it's just, how is God moving? How is God showing up? And that is where mm -hmm. I, I've been spending a lot of my time inviting people into those conversations. Um, and honoring that and hoping that they honor my own story. Because yes. it, is, it is that same God. We just sometimes view it a little bit different, view the movement of the spirit a little bit different, and we express it differently. But it is that same spirit that moves among all of us. Yes, thank you. And Fabio? Yeah, and on the same line, I believe is, um, part of this too is to work, uh, to talk often and a lot about diversity. We are not just one and uh, of the same. Uh, we have different backgrounds, different stories. And, and what I have been trying to do here uh, in this community, this uh, community of Winnet in Episcopal churches, um, uh, trying to bring programs like the, the children, they get together and they have, at this moment, I'm going to tell you exactly what is happening. Uh, one, um, let us put it in this way, one white mother is, and one Latino mother are teaching 
elementary school children, all of them for the entire parish. And uh, one, one Anglo white person and one Latino father are teaching uh, the middle and high schoolers. Mm -hmm. And all of them are one. Mm, uh, because I, and I do that because intentionally, because I believe is that generation is the generation that I, I re, they speak English. They are from different colors, as you can imagine. Um, uh, and it's beautiful. And they, they're open to that. They open to that. They find energy doing that, getting together, participating together in the programs. And perhaps they are the ones who are teaching, honestly, teaching the fathers and the, the parents that that is the way to go. If they go mm -hmm. to church, they ch it shouldn't be any sort of division. You don't go to a church to find divisions. You go to church to pray. And I am, I am father of, I have, I, I am, I father of three young ladies. And I, I have said several times in my conversation with clergy and churches, I wouldn't take my my girls because I love them to a church where they are not welcomed. I wouldn't do that to them. I want to find a church where they are respected and welcome and empowered to, to believe and to develop their faith. Right, yes. Juan, what would you add to this conversation? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, just some stories here, you know, about getting getting the two to understand each other. The, the two, uh, where I'm at, at present, you know, we have several services in English, but one of the things when I got there about eight years ago, we had the Spanish service, like many other churches. At, in the afternoon, we had it at 1.15. Or I've been at other churches, they don't have it until 5 o'clock in the evening. But mm -hmm. this particular one has it at, at 1.15. And we started talking. I said, well, the chapel is completely open, which holds about 120 people. I said, why, why can't we just move it there? And so we did. So now we have a, two concurrent services where we have the Spanish and the English going. And now we're getting some of the the uh, Anglo population coming in and joining the church because they like the music better, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I can't I can't exactly tell you that, but our music tends to be a little livelier than some of the uh, the Anglo music. I, lo I love some of the Anglo music, don't get me wrong. But this has brought brought some people in. We get students that are in high school and college that are studying Spanish or some kind of Spanish cultural studies that are coming in. And I always invite them in. And I invite all the priests to come over and join us and, and be part of it. Uh, it it's, uh, it's also interesting that for years I've been working and seeing how we could better communicate. And this past year, one of our members was uh, elected to our vestry. And that's one way, and, and she is able to bring back information from the vestry to, to share with, with our Spanish service, which is, I think, I think it's important to have them know that they are an important part of the church. They're not a mission. They're not another congregation. No, they're just another service within the, the context of the church. Mm -hmm. and that people do love them and that and one of the things we do every every month is that the, the last Sunday of each month we celebrate all the birthdays for that previous month so we have cake and Mexican coffee and and other other uh, goodies to eat and we always invite everybody to come and join us and sometimes they do uh, typically we have a few of them that'll come in and so they get to start understanding, you know, they hear a singing in there. Uh, for those of you that are not from this culture that we sing Las Mañanitas, which is a kind of a traditional birthday song in Spanish. And uh, so when they hear us singing that, they they like to come in, what's going on, you know? <laughs> but those are ways you, you have to invite and you have to do things that, that are going to pique their interest to get them together. Now, mm -hmm. we some of the things that Nancy and, and Fabio have talked about, you know, and, and when you look at these people, 
I don't care what, you know, whether black, brown, green, purple, or whatever. When I look in their faces, I see the face of Jesus. And, and, and Jesus is everywhere. And I tried, this is one of the things I've tried to, to uh, get across, not only to my Hispanic brothers and sisters, but also to my Anglo brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to just go back to follow one thread that, that you started with, Nancy, and saying it's important to understand that depending on what region you have come from, that, that that has a whole lot to do with your cultural perspective and the way you are being in the world. We have this idea of just lumping everybody into one bucket and thinking everybody's the same. So, you know, rather than being careful to say, well, where, where are you from? I mean, you're from, if somebody's from Colombia and somebody's from Honduras, you can't expect that they're going to be thinking all of the same things. They're from two different countries in two different parts of, you know, th- this difference. And we we don't tend, as uh, people in the United States have gotten lazy, uh, or maybe we're always lazy, about delineating that, you know, being willing to take a minute to understand where you're from and how is that different from if you were from uh, Mexico, if you're from, if you're from Honduras or Colombia, those are not the, those are not all the same thing. And in order to really relate, you need to be willing to listen while people from the different places help you to understand how who they are and and how things might be different, rather than just seeing them as one homogeneous group. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, as a black woman, I I live with a lot of microaggressions. Um, and from people not understanding and not and wanting to do the lumping and clumping and then making us all the same, we 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 sort of laugh about that sometimes when to keep from crying. I think that's probably the biggest reason we laugh. But how how do you how has it been for you all as brown people in this country that's constructed up on the hierarchies and ideas of supremacy. How does that, just personally, can you just say a a word or two about, or or however many words you want to say, about how that's been for you as individual people? Hmm. I can tell you a story if that would help. Well, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, first of all, let me address the, the the, the issue you're talking about of different cultures. So if you go to Guatemala, you have a set of traditions that they have. If you go to Colombia, there's going to be some different traditions. Mm-hmm. If you go to Cuba, there's going to be different traditions. So even throughout Central America and South America, they don't all celebrate the same things. Mm-hmm. You know, there may be a few of them that they've picked up over the years, like maybe Dia de los Muertos is more commonly uh, celebrated throughout Central and South America. But it wasn't always that way. Uh, you know, quinceañeras, you're seeing th- those have been around for years and years, and they came really, you know, from our Aztec brothers and sisters many, many years ago. And so not everybody celebrates them, but, you know, I think probably Fabio and Nancy have both celebrated their fair share of quinceañeras. And we could talk more about that if you want to later. You can question us about mm-hmm. it. Uh, but I recall going through high school uh, in Phoenix there and being a brown person. I never really thought much about being a brown person. I always thought I was latte. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I so I had a high school counselor that, uh, you know, was getting time to, to graduate. And I'd been talking to him. And he says, well, Juan, you shouldn't go to college. He says, mm-hmm. maybe a tech school but you, you probably won't make it if you do. Well, I thought that was rather odd from a high school counselor. Of course, I ignored him anyway. But, but then my sister came up a few years behind me. She had the same counselor, and he told her the same thing. And I said, well, this is not just for chance. This is a man that has you know, something 
he's he's biased against the the Latino that are in his group. You know, I don't know how many he mm -hmm. went through there because there was quite a few in my high school that were from, you know, one of the Hispanic countries. And if there have people like that to trying to uh, submerge us, if you will, you know, so keep us down so we don't don't move into other things. But to make a long story mm -hmm. short, I continued my quest in college and I have a master's degree. So I think I must've done something right in spite yeah. of, in spite of those things. And God has, has led me throughout. God has been with me all the time. And there have been times when I was down and in prayer and God brought me out of it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Fabio and Nancy, do you wanna reflect on that a minute? Yes, uh, first is about the, uh, the Latino America, the, the Latino people, Latinx people, more, more on that, what Juan, Juan is talking about, the diversity. Uh, for, uh, for me, as a Colombian, I have to come here in the United States and learn to be a Latino here. Uh, to be a mm -hmm. Latino in Colombia is different from being here. We, we have here about 60 million people, Latino people, uh, from different countries. And this makes us a new, a different world. A different world. I mean, you have to learn to eat something that is different, uh, is prepared in a different way, and uh, and you have to learn to enjoy that. Otherwise, you are going to be suffer suffering for the rest of your lives. So, it's come, coming here, it, it challenges you to be really open uh, and to learn from each other. I have to learn no Spanish vocabulary. Mm many things that we say in one in my place it doesn't is no doesn't have the same words in in another place and as i am preaching i have sometimes i have to name the same thing uh, three or four times in that way like playera camiseta you know t-shirt so i have to figure out what kind of people i'm talking to 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 connect, mm -hmm. to, connect to each mm -hmm. other and also to avoid certain words because in my country we say some words that are insulted to, uh, we, we could be insulting another person. So it's, it's, a, new, it's a different Spanish, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, mm -hmm. this is important because when I got, go to the Book of Common Prayer in Spanish, it doesn't, for me, it's like, what kind of language is this Book of Common Prayer? Uh, it, was translated, it was literally translated from English, but really that Spanish that we, we find in the uh, uh, Book of Common Prayer in Spanish, we cannot find that language in any place in the world. So now we have to start figuring out a new version, a new way to, to pray, because uh, again, that is not the, the way we speak. And um, then I went, when I came here, I went to, uh, to study theology up in, in Emmitsburg, in Emm Maryland. And um, I have to say a couple of things. Uh, many of them were, white Anglos, my classmates, and uh, many people didn't want to talk to us, you know? <laughs> many people didn't want to talk to us. Uh, they, they didn't want, want to, be, uh, to be part of our world. But then um, I have to say that I have a great, great classes, great teachers, and I figured out the ways to get good grades. And, uh, and then I had a good rector, good rector. And the rector said, how in the world these guys who are coming to learn a second language and theology in another language are doing much better than other guys, you know? And that helped us to check and balance a little bit the academic mm -hmm. work in that place where I was studying. Um, but I, but I, I love what Juan said. In, you, I am a priest, you know, and well, first of all, I am a baptized Christian, I guess is what I am. And my first vocation is to love people. It doesn't matter the backgrounds, where they are coming from, rich or poor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have a, the best time talking to a very, very poor people, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what color it is. If it is in front of me, I have to start a conversation and have a conversation and, and try to I mean, not too long ago, two weeks ago, I was celebrating a memorial se service from a family from Tan Tanzania, you know? Uh, and it was so beautiful and 
having a meal with them and learning about their country, learning about the culture and uh, with uh, the people from Tanzania, I, I really said at the end, we have so many things in common that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Nancy? Um, well, to answer your question, I mean, I think one of the things that I have experienced the most um, in this country was, is the sense of always being underestimated. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's something that is, is, is common for uh, not just Latinos, but I think people of color, we, there's this sense that they always underestimate us. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, um, while I have a problem with that, I, I like when people underestimate me because I like to prove them wrong. Um, you know, yes. I, 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 I don't underestimate us. Uh, don't underestimate our stories. Don't underestimate our faith. Um, don't underestimate the importance of, of family and community. Uh, those are, those are specific, specific things that are so important to, to, to our community um, and just to who we are. And um, as, as Juan was, was sharing, I remember uh, my sixth grade English teacher, um, because while I can sometimes speak without an accent, my accent shows up, you know, I play around the Spanglish is my first language, but really it was Spanish. So sometimes, um, especially when I was in, in middle school, um, I remember, I'll never forget my, my English uh, sixth grade teacher who um, shoved the paper back to my face and said to me, you will never amount to anything all of you brown people are just stupid. Whoa. Um, and the first time I got something published, I mailed it to him. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, yes. um, when, I, when I graduated from Divinity School, when I got my, my master's, I was like, I'm gonna send him an invitation. Uh, and, and, you know, I can laugh about this now. And there's still this, this like, little twinge in my heart of, if you said that to me, like how many other children did you say that in, in your history as a teacher, you know? And, and, and mm -hmm. those things are damaging. Well, while I can now say like, yeah, go ahead and underestimate me. You know, when I was 13, that devastated me. And for mm -hmm. many years, I still believe that I would never amount to anything. Even now, mm -hmm. as I get ready to, to like write, and I know somebody will read it, that fear comes back to me. Like, what if I forgot a coma? What if, you know, what if my grammar is not good? What if, what if my English teacher was right in sixth grade that, you know, I'm just mm -hmm. stupid. So I, I think we all have some of those stories that we have to, we have to fight against. Absolutely. I had somebody tell me I wasn't college material and I was so tempted to want to send my PhD, a copy of my PhD uh, to them when I when I got it from Emory. I thought, well, I might not be college material, but I have a PhD, you know, so I, so I know that, yes, that that whole business of being underestimated is really can be really challenging. And you're so right when you're young it really does impact you when, when you get to be a grown up and see yourself making it in the world. It, that's a bit different. So I, I know that um, though we said in the beginning that we don't wanna just, we didn't wanna just focus here on problems that face your communities, but I do think we cannot have a conversation without talking a little bit about two things, the impact of COVID up on your communities and also where are we with immigration in terms of the daily life of folks that you have to interact with? How is how are people being impacted? The qual their quality of life. How is the quality of life being impacted with just the the vitriol that comes out around some of this? That I think that you would know more as pastors and people engaged with uh, your parishioners and and people on a daily basis than somebody like me that that gets to talk to people like you but don't have the kind of day-to-day -day contact so if you could say a little bit about that and then afterwards we'll open this up and let folks put in questions in the chat to, to get in uh, I'm sure there's some people with some questions and and maybe some comments so and I don't care who starts I'm not gonna act like a teacher and call on you for this so <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and start if you want. Uh, you know, immigration is a constantly changing uh, 
background. There, there. I mean, just recently, the the judge struck down the DACA. What two days ago? Three days ago. So there you are, and and I know that's still going to be challenged, and I hope that that they will understand that. But this has been an ongoing problem for years and years, and and it's even more of a problem now. Uh, here in Georgia, we have uh, the Stewart Detention Center. I know Fabio is very well familiar with that, and uh, so they they house quite a quite a few folks down there. Uh, matter of fact, I think this past year, somewhere around a little over nine thousand people that have been in there, and they're called detention centers. But let's call them what they really are: they're prisons, they're places of of degradation. They're, the the health care they're provided is terrible. the The food that they have is probably you would probably just mostly throw it out if you were at home. Uh, and and you know their visitations are minimal. We uh, we, we do have fortunately a few places that are bright spots in there like El El Refugio, which is a home. Now, so this detention center is in Lumpkin, Georgia, where they're in the middle of nowhere. Seriously, there is nothing around for miles. But El Refugio is a home where they allow the uh, the families of the detainees to come in and visit. So the, the visitation, they get one hour a week. That's all they get, one hour a week. And it can be two, two family members uh, to go in at the same time. And during COVID, it was down to one person, one hour a week. So it was very, uh, just terrible conditions. So that we continue, and, and it's not just in this case, I mean, it's really, uh, it's highlighted because of the Hispanic population, because 50% of them come from Mexico and then El Salvador and Honduras and all the other countries. But then more recently, you've seen the influx of Ukrainians, of Syrians, and uh, even more, more recently, a couple of Russians that have come over. So, but some of these have been housed there at, at, at uh, Stewart Detention Center. But thank God for the work of uh, of El Refugio and what they do to make that. And it's actually gotten uh, monies to be actually build some more to house the people over the weekend so they can go in there and visit for their one hour a week, which I yes. think is totally, totally awful. That's all I can say. It's just inhumane. Because even for people on death row, death row, they don't limit. You can visit all day with them. You know, yeah, so you so they're treating the, they're treating these folks worse than we treat people on prisoners. death row. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Go so ahead. so go, go ahead, Fabio. I I want to give the word to Nancy because, and then I'll be last. Thank you, Fabio. Um, well, most of my experience has been working with people from um, first generation and 1.5 generation, and most of them are undocumented. Uh, regarding your question about how COVID has um, affected and continues to affect the communities that I have served, I mean, the impact is huge. Um, the, the level of, of uh, parishioners that I had that lost someone or knew someone that died of COVID because one, they couldn't, they couldn't get into the emergency room. They, they wouldn't even dare to call or, or go to the doctor because they lack documents. It doesn't matter if the news is telling you they're not gonna check for your documents. Like if you're undocumented in this country, you know that to go to the hospital, you know that to call the police, that is gonna put you and your family in danger. Um, a lot of the people that I, I serve, I mean, most of them lost their jobs. They, they worked at restaurants. They you know, they, they were cleaning homes. So the financial impact of COVID in the um, undocumented first generation uh, Latino communities has been huge. Very resilient communities and, 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 you know, they're doing their best and they are surviving as they can. Um, but the key thing is that they're surviving um, and it's really hard to thrive when, mm -hmm the deck is set against you. And that's what it, 
that's what it feels like to a lot of the, the communities that I personally have, have served. Um, in the issues of immigration, like, like Juan said, um, it changes day by day sometimes. Um, and we are having more and more people come into the, U to, into, the, into the US. And something that we don't talk about is the impact, the historical impact the United States has had in these countries that have continued to cause people to migrate to the US looking for a better life. Like the US is responsible for a lot of the poverty and a lot of the violence that is found in Latin America that causes them to leave their home countries and come back. You know, it's, it was the prison system the prison system that created the gangs that now live in El Salvador and Honduras is the, M the MS-13. It was the prison system here in the United States that deported um, people that in the prisons learned this lifestyle. So, I mean, yes, there's responsibility all around, but um, we have to be really honest about like the brokenness that exists in some of the Latin American countries. The US played a role in it. And, and we never tell that story. And the laws are not changing. People are being used as pawns. They continue to be used as pawns. Um, we, we see more and more often how undocumented people in this country are not seen as full human beings, uh, how they are, you know, I'll just say it, they are practically kidnapped, put in a plane and flown across the country with fake promises for a political stunt. Mm -hmm. They are not being seen as beloved children of God. They're being That's seen true. as as pawns for political stunts. So this is going to be a conversation that is going to continue. Where is the faith of voice leaders in all of this? Right. Yes, I wrote a very stinging blog about that trick that DeSantis pulled with people in Florida. How can you treat people as if they're just a, a cargo or... Uh, you know, don't have a life. I mean, how how can you how can you do that to people because you decide that they're not as they're not as good a human as you are? Yeah. And we do we 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 know how to do that. We know that drill really well in this country, unfortunately. And that's part of what we have to stand against every day because it's wrong. I don't care who it is that it's happening to, and none of us can afford to not speak against it being wrong. I mean, if you if you think it's okay, if you can acquiesce to it, you need to check yourself out. And especially if you sit up in church on Sunday morning, you really need to check out that. Yes, Fabio, don't get me started on that because it really just makes me very upset. You no, know? you go, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, yeah. because all of these brokenness in the system, um, we don't see what people are bringing to this country. And we don't see yeah. the, who the, the immigrants are. And in, in our ministry, Juan and, and Nancy, we see who they are, people who mm -hmm. love their families, people who work hard, and uh, they, don't, they don't forget the people who are left in their own countries. They share whatever, whatever mm -hmm. the bread that they are receiving here with their families in their own, own countries, people of great faith, uh, you know, a great, they are brave, brave people. Mm -hmm. uh, many, of, very often I, I really cry and I say, how they do that? Uh, like a few, few weeks ago, I got a, a family in my parish. They, they came to the border and they, yeah, they, they are one of those uh, families who are uh, considered like legal political tools. And they ended up here in, in Georgia and they came to my parish and they're, you know, great people uh, with a little girl, uh, uh, seven years old, and telling me the story, how they are trying to start and work through the system, uh, sending the girl to go to school, trying to find a job without having a car, without a place to live. Uh, to rent a place, they have to, they ask for the background check and they don't have anything, any documents to provide, to provide a background check, all of that. And then they, they are asking for a, a one month in advance deposit to rent a place. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how, oh my goodness, how they are going to do all of this? But like, like three months after, I see them that they are doing okay. Because one of the great things I see in the Latinos is that they help each other. 
they mm -hmm. help each other. They, they, they are, okay, come and live with me for a week and then find the place. And in unbelievable way, I believe that that is, that is one of the values that we don't see in the Latinos. Mm -hmm. The great faith, very uh, brave people, and the, a very strong sense of community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and Fabio, I know for a fact that during COVID, that folks were hit pretty hard in your community. So do you want to say a word or two about that? Absolutely. Uh, I lost uh, some people. And um, just to give you a, an example of um, four children lost bo both parents and uh, mm -hmm. they have to go back to, uh, to Mexico because they didn't have any rel close relatives here. They lost both of them and the parents were in their in their thirties, in the thirties, they have to mm. go back. It's just to, and and what Nancy said, many many people to know, they don't know. It. They are afraid of the systems. They are very afraid. So when mm -hmm. it's when they, they think about going to a hospital, going to a doctor, it's like okay, now they are going to know who we are, and mm -hmm. what is ahead of us. Maybe the family is going to be deported. Maybe we are going to be separated. And because this is how sometimes people solve, solve issues. There is a, mm -hmm. in immigration, there are a lot of things about separating children, separating mm -hmm. families. We'll take care of these couple, couple of children and somebody else will take care of these two. Like, like, like if they were no humans at all. Mm -hmm. So they, what they want to keep is the family together. And, and therefore they, they don't want to be seen by others. And they mm -hmm. literally they prefer in many cases to die rather than, than ask for help. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's safer to take a chance on dying than it is to ask for help. That's not the country I want to live in. You know, I don't want to live in that country where someone would feel that way. And that is the country that we have, that we have to, as people of faith, I think we have to keep resisting and standing against and say, not in my name, you can do it, but I'm not supporting this because, you know, it's horrible that you would be that scared, even because you know you can't trust the system. I mean, if they say we're not going to ask you for documentation, you go somewhere and somebody's going to ask you, and the next thing you're going to know is you're in trouble you know, because you can't trust that. So let, will you all help me look at who, what is in the chat and, and let me invite the audience to put in comments or questions that you might have for our panelists. And if you are thinking about what you want to say, you don't, don't think too hard because we don't have a whole lot of time and you need to <laughs> ask us okay. pretty, pretty soon, so. So Catherine knows, I, I just want to respond to Tom Blossom, who is a okay. member and EV at Christ Church Cathedral. We have, we, we've uh, captured one of your great singers there, Yuri Rodriguez. And she's up here at the seminar, uh, seminary at uh, Sewanee in Tennessee. And so I've been chatting with her lately. And uh, so mm -hmm. she came from your Coro Hispano at Christ Church Cathedral in Indianapolis. And, and just another time, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But my mm -hmm. son is also Coast Guard. He's a, uh, a warrant officer three, and, and he's been on cutters as well. So keep ministering to those people that are getting out of those terrible situations. And please keep working on your Spanish. <laughs> yeah, and someone just asked the question, uh, what do you prefer? How do you prefer? I think the question is, how do you prefer to be? considered in terms of ethnicity. You know, you all have the same problem we've got with if you're going to be African American or Afro American or black or whatever. And so and now it, you know, I somebody wrote me and said, somebody in the church who's a leader wrote me and said, I don't, I don't use Latinx. I'm Hispanic. And I thought, okay, I'm sorry to offend you, but I thought that, you know, so we just use Hispanic and slash Latinx. So what do you, what is it, is there a discussion about 
language like that in your, in your circles? And what do you, how do you resolve that? So right now that I'm in the academic world, that's definitely a lot of discussion regarding Latinx. Um, there's very strong feelings on, on all sides about uh, the word Latinx. Um, I prefer using Latin E, which is the Spanish version of Latinx because Latinx just doesn't make sense. And the only reason why I use that is because while I identify as female, uh, not everyone I serve uh, sees themselves reflected in our language because it is very gendered. So I, I, will, I will be okay with whatever people wanna be called, uh, but I prefer to use Latinx and Latina because I do feel it's more inclusive. And my job as pastor is to make sure that people feel seen. Um, mm -hmm. I understand there's problems with it, but there's always going to be a problem with it, right? Like a lot of us don't like Hispanic, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. but thank you for that question. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's it's a complicated question, and there's as much diversity as there is in Latino communities uh, with our ethnicities and culture and traditions. There's so many different thoughts on on what where we all prefer. <laughs> So um, my, my, my thing has always been like, just ask. Um, and if somebody feels offended, say like, okay, what would you prefer? Sure. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is the way to go because I see that some gen a generation like Nancy's generation, perhaps they are more open to use Latinx, but some generations that are older, they don't, mm -hmm. they say how, why they are, why, why are they changing the Latino or the Hispanic? So, Perhaps we are in that sense of at this moment trying to to decide which which one is the the right way to and there is no right way is that is what it, it will go back to the pe person how do you prefer to be called and and that is to get to get I was I learned about Hispanics here I was always thinking about I am a Latino Latin America in Latin America we don't talk about Hispanics. Hispanic is a term that you learn here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Latin, Latinx started here. It didn't start in Latin American countries, for example. So it's kind of- Well, there is, there, the, there is still conversation about um, transgender women of color in Latin America during the 60s, uh, 60s using the X. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there, there is some history that there, it, the word Latinx or something close to it was linked to those movements. But it definitely has become more popular, especially in the um, academic world, uh, with very liberal language. So I, it, it it could be problematic, but there is there is a lot of um, stuff that's coming out about uh, uh, transgender women of color in Latin America trying to find a new term to define themselves. Mm -hmm. And the biggest oh. issue is oh that lady left. The biggest issue is people seeing the face of God in everybody, regardless of what the label is and not to be trying to fudge on that by worrying about well what am I going to call you because I'm going to call you sister that's the or brother that's the most important thing I think or sibling sibling yes yes that's right because you might be transgender that's right I got to get it all straight it's it's a lot yes. to keep straight <laughs> so, so just just to tie on to what they were saying uh that was a big study that was done here at a local university. It's actually the third largest university in Georgia now, Kennesaw State. And I was trying to find the article, but it's called, it was titled, When is an Hispano not an Hispano? Mm. And it goes oh. into that because of the different countries. For example, if you go to Guatemala, uh, you know, their language is, their primary language is actually not Spanish, but it's Gichi. And so mm -hmm. they speak a lot of dialects, you know, but of course, if you go across the United States, even all the Anglos speak a little bit different dialects. If you go, if you're down mm -hmm. in the South or you're in the Northeast, or if you go to the Southwest or wherever, you know, there's gonna be changes in that. And That's then right. some of them are recognizable and some are not, but also, you know, <clears throat> what, what, do you, what are they called? You know, what, what name? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like for Catherine, that, she, you know, yes, exactly. So Catherine, I just call Catherine, and you know me, I just call Juan. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying they, to be funny, but it's true. I see myself as a man. I don't see myself. I, I don't see my color per, per se when I talk to people. It's just me talking to 
somebody else right. that I see as a person of God. So, and naming is important, and I don't want to. I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss that. No. I don't want to diminish that, but I think we don't need to get so preoccupied with it that we forget ultimately it's the person that we need to never lose sight of. We we have about five minutes left, and I want to invite the three of you to to tell us something that you think would be good for us to part on uh, from this conversation. I would, uh, most people who joined us tonight probably know that it's Hispanic Heritage Month starting, I guess it started what, uh, um, is September? Start September, September 15th. Yeah. September 15th to October, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a month. And the Center for Racial Healing is committed to trying to be inclusive in, in addressing all of the peoples who have suffered from oppression and racialized trauma who live in these borders. And that means that Latinx, Hispanic, Asian and Asian uh, and Pacific Islanders, uh, African-Americans and indigenous people and white people who have been wounded by racism and don't even know it. So we're trying to pay attention to all of that at the Center for Racial Healing. And so please go to our website and, and we have virtual library resources there that can help you if you are interested in doing some work around some of these things. This uh, panel tonight will be on our YouTube channel in a few days. So you can come back and listen if you want to, or you can share it with other people. So that's my Center commercial. Now I want to ask the panelists to spend the last minutes saying whatever last words they would like to have. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and speak up because, uh, and I've talked to Catherine about this in the past, we were doing what we called mini immigration film, pilgrimages, and we talk about different topics, including uh, ice court and taking people mm -hmm. down to El Refugio and that, although that's not possible now. So I'm looking at ways of restarting these, hopefully early in the year. And so I would, I don't know how we're gonna exactly formulate all of this, but I have a good idea of it. And it's usually about three different days, not all together, like a week apart, like say a, each Wednesday of the, month, of, the month, of the week for three weeks to get all of this. And it'd be a couple of hours each of those days to help you better understand immigration and what is going on in this country. Uh, I want to say that um, I believe many of the uh, of those who are with us, those who are attending this uh, conversation tonight, are Episcopalians. So my invitation would be to um, open the doors. If you have a community of faith and um, and you want to grow and you want to have some energy in your in your worship space. Invite, invite some Latinos, get to know them. Um, mm -hmm. Many people, uh, and somebody said here in the chat, how they are coming to you. It, it is unbelievable. Some, some uh, Latino families want to be part of us. They are finding us and they are finding that this is the faith that they want to be part of because of the, some, they find that this uh, the church is, uh, has more progressive theology. And that is what they want to be in, the, in, a, in a theology that is more progressive and a, a very welcoming community. So that, that would be my invitation. Go to a restaurant during this uh, Hispanic mm -hmm. Heritage Month. Or if you, in your place where you live at, um, there is any cultural aspects of, about Latinos, uh, try to participate, try to find more about who we are and where, where are we coming from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, and I will, I will just add, um, for many, many years, we treat the, we have treated the, the Latino community in the Episcopal Church as a charity project, mm -hmm. um, as those poor people that we are called to, to save and, and, and to serve. And it's, it's time we change that conversation of, we need to be partners in ministry with the communities around us. We need to um, help uplift our Latino leaders who are there, who are doing amazing work. We need to hand them the mic. We need to make sure that uh, 
we provide the resources that are needed for communities, uh, Latino communities and communities of color to thrive in our neighborhoods. The, the voice of the churches have power. So we need to engage our lay people in, in conversations of what does it look like for us to be engaged, uh, engage in partnerships with the Latino community in our neighborhood. It's not about us going out to serve them, but how do we together serve with one another for the glory of God? Like those are the conversations that we need to be engaged with because Latinos, like any other community, we bring so much beauty, so much flavor, so much color, so much rhythm um, into, into the church. Let's honor all of that. Um, but we need to engage in hard conversations. Uh, we need to make sure that some of the stuff, you know, it's not about the language. It's not, a, it's not just about Spanish. While Spanish plays a big role, there is second, third, fourth, fifth generation Latinos in the United States who are looking for a church. And they speak English much better than a lot of us. You know, um, they may not even speak Spanish. So it's not, don't, don't get stuck in the idea that I have to speak Spanish. You don't, you have to speak, you have to speak the language of God and that is love um, and see their belovedness. So I will stop there, but uh, thank you all for joining us. And these are wonderful conversations and I pray that we get, a, get an opportunity to have more of this. Well, I promise you that there'll be more of them and, and I'll be in, engaging you all and other people as well, uh, because we, we're not joking about the, having this uh, global conversation around these issues around oppression. That's one of the places where we start leveling the playing field by saying that oppression is oppression and it's unacceptable for anybody to be the victim of it. And we, we, who, have, we who seek freedom have got to be always willing to seek freedom for everybody or else we're just fooling ourselves. So, you know, so you can count on more, more invitations to come do things with the center and all of you in the audience, please uh, think, thank you so much, first of all, for joining us. And then please think of ways that you can just take a step that makes you a half a shade braver in dealing with some of these issues that we've been talking about tonight. It may be just helping somebody be more kind in terms of how they think about somebody who's different from them. So good night, everybody. And thank you all. Thank you, Nancy and Juan and Fabio. Thank you for being my, my friends and supporters and, and for being the faithful folks that you are. You make my life so much better just knowing you. So thank you. And you make ours better too, Catherine. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> everybody. All right. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Yeah.